Hello and welcome, my lovely, sweet, wonderful, tenderly roasted tiger aficionado goons and gals out there. Welcome to today's video where I will be talking about everything that you ever needed to know about the Triumph Tiger 800. So maybe you're in the market for a second hand used one of these things. Maybe you're just a tiger aficionado and you just love watching Triumph Tiger videos. You came to the right place because what we're gonna do is talk about everything that I've ever learned about owning this motorcycle. As many of you know, it was this very bike that gave birth to the Born Nagoon channel when one day I decided to take this on some super stupid single track where this bike shouldn't belong and film that adventure on a cell phone. Now feel free to find that video right here on the channel. But now I'm on my fourth year of ownership with this bike. I have a little over 20,000 miles and I've done a lot of videos over that time about things that I like, things that I dislike, design flaws and everything in between, but I've never done one single full comprehensive video. So that's what we're going to try to accomplish here is just diagnose this bike from front to back and talk about everything I've learned about that, the things I like that I dislike over those four years and those 20,000 miles. <laughs> So we begin with the front of the motorcycle and let's talk about the brakes. On the Tiger 800, you have two 305 millimeter front discs with Brembo caliper brakes. And these will be all the brakes that you'll ever need for this bike. You'll just occasionally need to change the brake pads. They do a phenomenal job in their stock format. And when I say that, they have great feel and grip and feedback through the entire stroke. So if you've ever ridden something like a super bike, a high performance motorcycle, or let's say a Ducati, Sometimes that initial bite when you apply pressure is so strong and the brakes are so good that it feels like you're going to just fly off and endo the motorcycle. Then you have bikes with not so good brakes where you really have to apply a lot of pressure to get any kind of initial feel. Not so here on the Triumph. These are phenomenal stock brakes. The moment you apply pressure, you get just the right kind of feedback and just the right kind of grip initially. And as you continue to apply pressure throughout the stroke, you have consistent braking the whole way through the range. And that's very good. You don't even need to change the, the brake lines or anything like that. They're great in their stock format. If you don't like them when you first get it, you can obviously change the brake pads, but they're good enough the way that they come. Now on the XC models over the XR, Triumph has a lot of different Tiger 800 models, but the, the main difference is that the XR models are street oriented. So they're gonna come with a smaller front tire that's more street oriented with cast aluminum wheels where the, let's say the XCs, the off-road versions of this are gonna come with the spoked wheels. I'm gonna say that these rims are pretty good for what they are as well. And they're gonna do most riders just a good enough job out there. I have bent mine a few times by hitting some obstacles, but I'm not going to be critical about that because I shouldn't have taken the bike in some of the places that I did. But for most riders, the rim is going to be fine. You have the 90, 90, 21 front inch tire. There's going to be a lot of options out there in the aftermarket to fit it with the kind of tire that you need. So everything's going to be good there. Now we'll move to the suspension here and suspension is always something that's rider specific. I found this bike, to be too soft in most of its settings when it comes from the factory. Now we'll talk about settings here in just a little bit on how to set up this bike. You have a 43 millimeter upside down WP suspension on this. It's a rugged suspension, but it is very, very soft. So if you're weighing, let's say over 180 pounds, maybe 200 pounds, you're probably gonna wanna fit this bike out with some heavier springs. Now that's just my opinion. Somebody who owns a Tiger may find that to be completely opposite. However, what I think is the real issue here is the actual length of this fork. And this is something that I complained about in some of my other videos, especially for those that want to do any kind of extensive off-road riding. The thing about the Tiger here is its geometry. Now, if you look at the bike, if I can just kind of show it here, you'll see that the front end slopes downward. There's a lot of weight on the front end of this bike versus maybe something like a KTM 890 or a Yamaha Tenere or the new Aprilia Touareg or something. If you look at those bikes, they're going to have a much longer front end or a higher ground height there. You're putting a lot of weight on this bike and it's already a bike that weighs 450 pounds dry, probably 500 full of fluids here. Not only that, if you look at the gas tank here, it slopes forward. This carries five US gallons of gas, but a lot of that gas, when you fill it up, is floating in the front of this tank. So you have all that fluid towards the front of the tank with this rake and trail of the bike, and you're gonna have a lot of weight on the front. Now, if you don't know a lot about motorcycle geometry or whatever, 
What that really means is if you're on the street, that's amazing because you have a lot of weight on the front, much like the, the triple over here where you have that weight bias to the front and that gives you a lot of feedback and a lot of grip when you're on asphalt. But it's not a good solution when you're off of the road because when you're off of the road there, you've got too much weight on the front and it wants to bury in things like mud, lonely terrain, sand, or any kind of soft terrain, it's gonna to wanna to bury that. So if you're somebody that's looking to do extensive off-road, which I'm not saying if you're gonna buy this bike, that's what you're, you're gonna do. If you're really gonna do hardcore off-road, get you something like that. But if, you're, if you do wanna do that, and, and look, this is why I call myself a goon, because maybe you start and say you're not going to do that, and you go down a trail and you're like, well, I'm gonna finish this thing, right? This is where the Triumph starts to have a little bit of trouble right here in that front end. So let's go ahead and talk about the engine on this motorcycle. And for me, I'm 50-50 on this thing and I'll explain. If you're interested in buying a Triumph, there's two things that make people want this bike. One is its sexy European looks. The other is the unique character of this triple engine. Where most of the adventure bikes out there have twin engines, this uses a triple. Now, if you have a twin, you feel that instant grunt. You have that torque. And I think that kind of engine works a little bit better off-road. This thing doesn't quite have that feeling. You have to wind it out like it's a 125cc two-stroke or a little 80 to get the most out of this bike and to feel the rush of its claims 94 horsepower. You really have to wind that bike out because it doesn't come on really until about four to 5,000 RPMs where you'll get a little bit more feel out of a twin at a much lower RPM. Now it will wind out quite a ways and it's a good engine, and it's also a very durable engine. As I've said before in some of my past reviews, I think people overlook the quality and reliability of many European motorcycles because they discount them against their Japanese counterparts. I have just uh, over 20,000 miles, like I said earlier on this bike. I haven't had a single problem. I mean, not a single problem with this engine. All I've ever done was change the oil. It still has the original clutch. It still has all the original componentry in here. Zero problems. It's never failed to start once. So if you're somebody that's really thinking about reliability and whether a Triumph is going to deliver, trust me, this bike will never ever leave you stranded. And if you look around, you're going to see many of them with 50,000 miles on it or more. Now, personally, well, this is just a personal preference. I'm not saying this is how it will fit for everybody. I wish they would have used the Speed Triples Motor 1050 and stuffed it in here. The bike does need more power for me, and we'll talk a little bit about that later when I get to the traction control and other systems on it. So in a review, the engine is very, very durable. It sounds super sexy and amazing, and it purrs so nicely on the highway. But I find it to be a little bit anemic compared to something like a KTM 890. Uh, Yamaha Tenere, they have a little bit more torque, even though there's less horsepower there, and definitely an Africa Twin. So if you're somebody that wants to feel that, that you know, by the seat of your pants rush when you crack open the throttle, you're not going to get that here. Now, something else I want to highlight here is that Triumph fits these with some crash bars on the side. This crash bar, to me, is defective where it sits. And one of the things I highlighted in my five design flaws was there is a piece here that connects to the engine of the motorcycle up towards the front. And it's casted into the engine when it is built and is part of the upper and lower casing of the motorcycle. It takes very little pressure to break that. And if you can, uh, you're not gonna be able to see it here on the camera, but it comes right into here. It's just a little piece like this where a screw goes into it. Very little pressure it takes. I think if you kicked it with your foot, you can break it. I've already broke mine in like a fall in a parking lot. It didn't take much. The problem with it is you cannot fix that without replacing the lower casing of the motorcycle. To me, that's a significant problem. Now, the, the crash bars can still work without being mounted there, although they'll lose some stability but there's other solutions in the aftermarket. So I would suggest if you're going to buy this bike and you're going to do off-road, get rid of this. You know, I don't know why I still have it. Maybe I'm a cheap bastard, but get, get rid of this and get something that doesn't connect to that upper part. The parts where it connects to the engine down here are stable enough, but this is one of the worst design flaws I've seen, even though mine is still in stock form, which I'm gonna go through a build project on this a little bit later. The 
aluminum pan on the bottom of here is, is flimsy aluminum. Now something else I didn't mention those design flaws for my bike here, it was actually just glued two rubber pieces on the very bottom back here. And it didn't take long for that to, to break off after, after hitting a rock. Now, if we move to the back here of the bike, uh, one of the other issues with this one, but has been well documented before on the earlier models, which uh, Triumph has since changed since coming out with a 900, is that these pillion or passenger pegs are welded to the subframe. The subframe is also welded to the main frame here. So if you loop this bike out or you drop this bike, if you bend this or you bend that, which is very, very easy here, if you bend those, the bike could actually be totaled. And again, that's a, these are two major design flaws here because you really don't have to be involved in that much of an accident in order to bend these. As far as the foot pegs here, they're trash. And you see, I, I've just lived with the trash of this bike. I haven't done anything to fix them. I'm just telling you about it. Another thing that I kind of left out as I moved across here was this front brake. This front brake needs, I mean the rear brake, excuse me. This thing needs rebent back into position almost every single time you ride it, even on the street. It's just paper thin, and I'm surprised that it hasn't broken off. Now on the rear tire here, I mean everything's fine. The rear brakes work, swing arm works, the pipe sounds really, really nice. Two grab handles here, which most adventure bikes come with. So that's the bottom half of this bike. I don't believe I left anything out. I'm going to think here real quick. No, I don't. I think that's just about everything. So in a review, you've got great front brakes. You've got a pretty decent front suspension, but it's going to need some work. The problems are that the front end is really, really heavy on this bike. The crash bars are very, very weak. The pillion pegs are welded on here as well as the, the subframe. And your front brake is pretty cheesy. Great parts about this bike is that the brakes do work very, very well. The front rims is pretty sturdy. The engine sounds wonderful and is very, very smooth. And the bike works perfectly and flawlessly on the highway. So I'm going to handhold the camera right now. And I apologize. I'm going to try not to blare which project you guys and make you nauseous. I want to talk a little bit about this cockpit. And we'll begin by the windscreen. And there's some mixed reviews about this. Some riders like it. Some riders do not. Uh, I think it's awesome because it's very easy to adjust. All you have to do is just push out on the screen and lift it up or lift it down. And you can just adjust it however you see fit. The problem with that adjustment is it's also very flimsy. So as you can see, the windscreen moves around a lot. If you're moving down the freeway at about 60, 70 miles an hour, you're going to hear that. Now, if you have earplugs on or a thick helmet, it won't be so bad, but it is present there. And there is some buffering coming from the windscreen. I don't find it to be a problem, but I do understand riders that do. Also, all of this stuff up here is very flimsy. I know it's not intended to be a supercross dirt bike, right? But it is flimsy, and I think they could have done a little bit better job, but hey, that's the way that it is. I'm on my third one of these, and I finally got tired of replacing it, because almost every time I dump it, this breaks too instead of the windscreen, and I now have it zip tied on here, and I can't even get another one right now because of all the back ordering on COVID. There's also something I pointed out in my design flaws when we're discussing the cockpit, a couple of things that I don't like that maybe you should be aware of that you probably won't run into as a problem, but I'm going to bring that up. One is if you take a look right here, this mounting bracket that holds on all of your TFT display and all of your unit, this metal bar right here, is welded, let's see if we can get a good view, there we go, is welded into the frame. So just like the passenger pegs, if you get into some sort of an accident, and again, I want to make something clear about accident. It doesn't have to be a head-on collision with a Mack truck. It could just be small tip-overs or just peculiar ways that the bike tips over if you're going to take it off-road or hell, maybe even in the parking lot, right? If this bends technically the frame could be salvaged. Now mine has already been bent, and I don't know if you can see it, um, but I've actually bent it back, but it bent more up here at the top, not down here. But that's something that you'd have to fix yourself or, uh, I don't know, salvage the bike. Something, again, you should be at least aware of. And I bring this up because what I do want to make clear one more time is it doesn't have to be a high-speed accident. We don't have to be doing something crazy like trying to freestyle our bikes. It's just something that could easily happen by tipping over. Just as with this, the engine guards, 
that's something that could just break in, in a tip over if you just slip. The same thing here, it's very vulnerable to being broken. Now there's a front piece that holds this on. It's an aluminum bracket. I've broken that too, unfortunately. That's a pretty cool design back here because it's meant to snap quickly if this thing does get into that accident. So it reduces the possibility of damage there. But those are a couple of design flaws. I wish this was something that was bolt boltable so where you could change this out if that happened. But it is what it is and I thought I would bring that up. So let's spend a minute or two here on the display. And just from a graphical standpoint, it's really nice. It changes colors between night and day. I find that's cool, although you can turn that off if you don't like it. But I think it's graphically pleasing. Plus, it's very easy to change the way that you would like to have your display. Now on this, they have some basic features, such as you can check your gas, set your tripometer and stuff like that, check your coolant. But it doesn't have anything like checking tire pressures and so on. Now, depending on what kind of Tiger model that you purchase, this is where the real money comes in between the different models is the type of rider modes that you get. The upper models are going to have all the available features, while the lower models are going to have some. So it's important that you pay attention to what you're buying here or looking at here, because this is what really separates these models more than anything else, because it's something you can't change. If you don't like the tires, you can change that. You don't like rims, you can change that. But you can't redo the software on the bike unless you really are sophisticated and have lots of time on your hands. Now, it's really easy to move through the menu. You have over on the handlebar switch here, you also have heated grips, but you have this nice little toggle switch and a menu button. Now, something about this toggle switch, it has broken on me before. It's very flimsy, and it's probably because I keep switching back between different modes. But the thing is, it's not something that's just so easy where you can replace this piece of plastic. It's a whole unit. So Triumph covered it under warranty for me, but the dealership that put it on messed up my heated grips, and I'd go back and do it a couple of times. But anyway, just thought I would mention it. All you have to do is just hit the menu here and it'll bring up the rider modes that you have. And you just move the toggle through it. So you have a rain mode, a road mode, a sport mode, a off-road mode, then you have a off-road pro mode. Now I've been pretty critical about this and some people haven't necessarily agreed with me and here's why. I think the rain mode that you have on this bike, this, the road mode, and maybe even the sport mode these modes are, are practically useless with this traction control because to me, here's how traction control should work. When you break your rear tire loose and you cross that plane, it should cut the RPMs to the engine just enough to stop the progression of that slide. This bike doesn't do that. What it does is it completely cuts the RPMs by 1500. So it's this drastic, like you're chopping the throttle which is worse, that's what you don't want. If you're going up a hill, it, forget about it. It can actually stall on you. And I don't find those to be very usable, but to each their own. Very easy to program everything inside of this display. You come over here and you have a home screen. You click on the home and it will allow you to toggle through and change your riding modes where you can engage or disengage the settings like traction control, the type of map that you want. You have bikes set up where you can go through how you want your indicators, disabling ABS. Now, not all of the rider modes allow you to disable traction control and ABS. You have trip set up, display set up, and then you can, of course, reset everything to default if you make it. Now, most Triumphs, the only ones that allow you is the Off-Road Pro to completely remove the ABS and also change the map and to remove the traction control. If you make a change to the bike, then what you will end up seeing is a small helmet that's located down here at the bottom. I'm going to try to zero in. If it has a small helmet at the bottom like that one, let me go back in there, right here, that one has a small helmet on it, and that's the only one here. That means that you have made an adjustment to the original setting inside of this. So again, if you're going to buy one of these or you have one of these, make sure that you really pay attention to this traction control. I think for me, the rider modes, it's, I'm, I'm always an off-road pro. I'd prefer not to use any traction control with this bike. I think the way that it is, for me, it doesn't need that. But everybody's different. Maybe you're riding in worse terrain. One thing I do like about it that I was critical in the beginning, but it has since changed my mind, 
and that is ABS, front ABS. So I usually have that programmed in Off-Road Pro. So if I'm going down a very steep, rocky, slippery hill, I do like to have front ABS engaged because it just makes the bike easier to ride. It's just nicer. So maybe this old guy here is warming up to some of the traction control things, but all in all, it's a really nice looking display here. And those are the overview of the rider modes that are available. And it's pretty simple to Again, you can look at them from the menu, toggle it with the switch over here. And if you want to change any of the mapping, traction control or ABS, you just basically hit it here on the home screen and it will take you into the main menu where you can make just about any adjustment that you need to. Now I want to go back and visit the front suspension as I mentioned a little bit earlier. And one of the cool things about this bike is that you have these handy little knobs right here at the top. No more laying on the ground and digging a screwdriver up in there to make some quick clicks on the trail or the road. You can just simply reach over here. On the right side, the red one is your rebound adjustment. And over here, the white one is your compression adjustment. You do not have preload on the front, but that's okay. It's nice just to have these quick clickers. Another thing I'd like to mention as a little bit of a nuance, if we want to nitpick this bike a little bit, is this cigarette lighter and power outlet. This is for European model only. This is how it comes in the United States. And it's not a big deal, but you think somebody like Triumph would have thought this out to either fit this with a cigarette lighter or input power that matches United States on United States model bikes, or they would have provided you with a power source to convert this, an adapter. Now you can buy the adapter online for like eight to $10, so it's not that big of a deal. But when you're paying $15,000 for a brand new bike, maybe that's not something that you feel you should do. That's just my thoughts. As we move back here a little bit, I wanna talk about the, the seat, not the seat exactly, but the positioning of the seat. Something I talked about the first time when I got this bike was, if you notice, the seat isn't straight up and down. The frame actually sticks out a little bit. If you go over here, this piece of the frame sticks out. So it's not straight up and down like a lot of bikes. If you are a rider that uses their legs a lot, like I do when I'm riding, they seem to always, the inner parts of your knees and thighs connect with this frame. And it's kind of annoying. It's not the worst thing in the world, but it is a little bit annoying and you may have to change up your riding style like I did. Now, if you're leaning back here, this part of the seat is very thin. So it's okay right here. Sometimes even when you're seated, your knees will bang against that, but you'll get used to it because you're not gonna wanna deal with having your knees all bruised up every time like that. It's, it's quite annoying. Another thing is the tank itself is very thin. So if you're sitting down, gripping it with your knees is easy. But another thing that's kind of like that makes this bike cool looking is its, its lines and its design. But these design features are also a negative off-road, let's say, and that is the width of the tank. Look how wide this is, how it kind of peaks downward. It doesn't take much to hit the sides of these if you're going through any sort of single track. Again, that's not what this bike is for, but it's not hard to do that. It's also, if you tip it over, this can easily hit the ground, which mine has. I have dents on both sides of these. Very easy to dent it, even if you have the crash bars. And I've noticed that even on the Tiger 900, they never address this issue. There should be some form of plastic or some sort of guard, something to slow down. And even if you see the press bikes, there's a lot of those bikes that have dents on them as well. And when I say these things, I'm not saying that you, you have to ride like a goon idiot like I am. These can happen in small speed situations and small incidents. And if you're gonna take a bike like this off road, even if it's a fire trail or a fire road, there's still a chance you'll have a low speed dump just from the sheer weight of a bike like this. And that's understandable. These things can break real easily. You don't have to be going full out Ricky Carmichael style on this for that to happen. Just my two cents here. Now we'll come back and we'll talk about the seat in general. I'm gonna tell you what, man, this is the best thing about this bike is the seat. This thing is super comfortable. You can log hundreds of miles. You will not have a numb rear end. You will feel good. It's like a lazy boy chair. It's an amazing seat. The best seat on any motorcycle that I've ever ridden. Now this is the XCX model, so it's just the seat, but the XCA has a heated seat like this. I bet that's nice and toasty on a good cold day. Real easy to take the seat off. All you do is take the key out of the ignition, put it back in the license plate, 
and this comes off, the back piece comes off first. And inside here, you'll have a small storage compartment. Hopefully, if you bought this from somebody, they gave you the toolkit or the toolkit came with it, which is a, just a small basics toolkit, but you can also build your own and put it in here. And there's also a USB port. So if you want to charge your phone from here, run a wire up to the front, or you have something else that you'd like to put back in here and charge up while you're riding, you can do that. And it's nice and coated in here, so it does not get hot when the engine is running or the engine heat does not come back up here on the bike. All you have to do is just reach back here and pull the seat off and the front comes out. Now the seats are adjustable on this. Let me flip it around here for you. And all you have to do to take it from low to high is you'll see this little plastic thing. I'll try to do my best while I'm holding the camera here. And you just pull it out and you can just move it to the next clip. So you can pull it out here and move it over here. Take it out like this. And this way, I'm sorry guys. And you can just move it up, move it down, and then put it back in and you're good to go. Same way on the front. You could take that out, move it down, and you're good to go with that. Just your typical battery in here, power stuff and etc. Nothing too stylish here. Now let's talk about something that uh, is kind of a pain in the ass. Changing or cleaning the air filter. Now in the earlier adventure bikes, they never really addressed this problem. They just built the bike. You have to take off, loosen up this piece, loosen up this to get to the tank. And you have to even go around to the front where the radiator is and unloosen some bolts to get this tank off so you can get to the air filter, which is underneath of that. It's about 35 minutes to do all of that just to get to the filter. Now, on the newer bikes, they've addressed that. Some have put them back here. They, they've taken care of that. But on the older 900, I mean 800s, excuse me, they haven't. And that's one of the things that you will have to do. So it's a general walk through here of the top part of the Tiger 800. And oh, something else I forgot to mention, you have a nice little standard grab handles, if you want to call them, or... A luggage rack there that makes traveling and touring or the packing your bags real easy. So before I wrap up this video, I think there are a few things I left out as I was doing the walkthrough. I don't believe I said anything about the rear suspension. It's a pretty good suspension for what it is if you're 180 pounds or less. If you're over that, you're going to have to do something about the springs on it. Also, you're going to have to do that because it only has rebound and dampening adjustment on it. Preload, excuse me, preload and dampening adjustment on it. No compression. So you can't do anything about it as it is, but it works okay. Now, if you look at any of the Triumph videos, even in their promo videos and even on the 900, the real problem with the rear end of the bike is the front end of the bike being so heavy. If you've noticed a lot of those promos off-road, you'll see that the rear is always kind of huckabucking forward like this. I don't think you can get rid of that unless you completely change the geometry of this motorcycle. And that's just the way it is. Uh, for most of us, you just ride around it and just do what it can. It's not a, a major problem, but that problem is there and you should be aware of it, especially if you're a heavier rider. The other thing is the drivetrain on this bike is excellent. I kept the original chain and sprockets on this for probably a lot longer than I should have, around 12 and a half to 13,000 miles, I think it was. Now, if you're buying it used, Maybe the previous owner has already done that for you, which is great. If you're buying a bike that has the original drivetrain on it, and maybe it has 7,000, 8,000 miles, it's still good. I mean, sure, you should replace it earlier than that, but if you're tight in the wallet, it's not something that you immediately have to do, especially if you want to address some other issues with the bike. Handlebars are nice. Handguards suck. Uh, but then all adventure bike handguards pretty much suck from the factory. I don't think they bake those for off-road riding. I think it's just for show and most people replace those. Now speaking of that, that's what's going to lead me into wrapping up this video. I apologize for the dirtiness of this bike and the neglect. It's kind of just been sitting around here while I've been wavering on what to do with this motorcycle. I obviously just had recently bought this CR450 RL and it fulfills all my needs. It is perfect on the street for what I'm using it for right now since I'm not doing any long distance riding right now at this moment. I also want to convert this into a supermoto and get back into that. That's another complete story. I won't spend much time in that area. But it's also an awesome off-road bike. Now it comes with problems as well. You can look at my videos here on this channel. This is about the Tiger today. 
but my intention was to sell this bike. I'm having a really hard time doing that, to be honest with you. Out of the 40 years I've been riding motorcycles, and I don't know how many I've owned, probably at least 50 different motorcycles, I don't think there's ever a bike that I was so reluctant to get rid of as this Tiger 800. And that should say a lot about this Triumph. And I think you're going to see that theme amongst Triumph owners. It's a special brand that brings out a special character and a sort of a loyalty to it, which I thought I never would have. I've just had so many experiences on this bike, so many stories, so many good times. I think about all the things this bike has made me do. And when you really think about what is a good motorcycle, it's one that makes you want to ride it. It makes you want to travel and adventure and get out and go and do and see. And I did that on this bike. I mean, I've taken it to a lot of places and I've had a lot of fun and I've met a lot of people with this bike. And otherwise, I wouldn't have done that on another motorcycle. And I can't say that for the other two that I have here that I've done the same thing. This bike has been very special to me and I've just found it hard to get rid of. So sometimes we get like that, right? And I didn't know if I wanted to just clean this thing up and sell it or if I just wanted to keep it. The more I talk about it, the more I wanna just fulfill my own inner fantasies here, so to speak. I wanna strip it down, see how much weight I can get rid of it, maybe get a fancy paint job and just say deck it out really cool, make it aggressive, apocalyptic off-road style and, and see what kind of crazy thing I can come up with in my mind. Let me know if you guys think that would be awesome for the channel if I just kind of, I don't know, just started cutting things off of it and just make this really cool motorcycle. Not a goon bike, but a really cool bike. Maybe a bed line, the tank, I don't know. I got a couple kinds of stuff in my mind. Uh, but again, I'm having a really hard time selling it. So on that note, let that be a testament to what this bike is. Again, Triumph is, is, is an interesting brand. When you get on the bike, this is a bike I thought I would sell the first week I owned it. But the more I rode it, the more I fell in love with it. And here I am four years later, unable to get rid of it. It truly is a work of art. It's an amazing motorcycle to me. This triple engine is awesome. The reliability is awesome. And I think if you buy one of these, I'm for sure if you buy one of these, you will not regret that purchase. It won't be something that you're going to look back on in a couple years ago. Damn, I should have never bought that bike. You're going to have fun on this bike. You're going to want to ride this bike, and this bike will treat you well, even if it's been used by someone else. So guys, I hope you liked this video. As always, if you want to keep in touch with me here, subscribe to the channel and start a dialogue. Let me know if you own a Tiger 800 and 900, what you got down there in the description box. Let me know some of your adventure bike stories. Love to hear where you guys have gone, what you have ridden, what your experiences are with motorcycles. And if I left something out, which I'm sure I did as I was gargling along, be sure to bring that up too. Until next time, as I always say, whatever I discussed in today's video was just my opinion and I could be wrong. Take care.